Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. Uh, I want to give a shout out to, to Sandy Nightingale. Thank you so much for the new coffee thermos. I made my bride a cup of coffee and gave it to her in that because she was volunteering in Ace's classroom. And so I'm so sorry. I meant to use the thermos that you gave me to replace my, my trusty old red one. Uh, so for now, I'm, I'm rocking one that, that shows the cross over Pensacola Beach where I, where I grew up playing in the waves and surfing. Matthew chapter 12. We just saw the story of the healing of the man with the shriveled hand. Now, when I was filming out in the snow, uh, I couldn't look this up because I was getting water dripped all over my Bible. So here's, as promised, the, the reference in Mark chapter 3 verse 5 that gives us the additional insight into Jesus' emotional state as he healed the man with the shriveled hand. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. After looking around at them with anger, he was grieved at the hardness of their hearts and told the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and his hand was restored. Wow. When I get angry, man, I'm more likely to lose my temper. I'm more likely, I'm more likely to, you know, to punch something, you know? Like I'm more likely to, I'm more likely to hurt somebody's feelings. When Jesus lost his temper, he healed a man. <laughs> he would overturn tables in the temple. You know, uh, for those who were trying to contort the law of God and monetize, you know, uh, monetize a false teaching about people's worship. They, when Jesus got angry, righteousness came out of him. And that convicts me. I find that beautiful and challenging and a literally Christ-like thing for us to aspire unto. Be angry, yet in your anger do not sin, the book of Ephesians teaches us. Being angry is not a sin. In fact, at times, a lack of anger indicates an issue in our hearts. There are things, injustices, acts of evil in the world, Right, where the innocent are hurt, that ought to stir up a righteous anger in our hearts. Jesus' anger was never directed towards someone who confessed sin. It was always directed toward the hyper-legalistic Pharisees who placed loads of legalism and harsh judgment on his people. His harsh words were all saved for them. Same with John the Baptist. Jesus would not squash someone who is struggling with sin. When I say struggle, what I mean is they're trying not to sin and they feel discouraged when they fall back into it. That conviction represents the work of the Holy Spirit on your heart. You're like the smoldering wick of Isaiah 42. You're like the bruised reed of Isaiah 42. Isaiah is our next book that we're gonna study. We're currently in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew part two is next. Right? You can find the printed book for the new one coming up this week on Amazon. But after that, we're going to Isaiah. So I want to show you as many times as I can Isaiah in Matthew. And then when we're in Isaiah, I want to show you Matthew. Here's Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 15. Jesus was aware of this, meaning the Pharisees plot to kill him, and withdrew. Large crowds, literally translated many crowds, so if you add up all the crowds, they become a large crowd, but you have these different factions, different groups, different classes and walks of life, all following him, and he healed them all. He warned them not to make him known, so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And here's where the text quotes Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not argue or shout, and no one will hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed. He will not put out a smoldering wick until he has led justice to victory. The nations will put their hope in his name. Exquisite, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. The ministry of Jesus on the earth in his first coming was one in which he would reach out to the downcast. He would give those who were covered in ash signs of mourning beauty, garments of praise in exchange for their heaviness. He looked upon them 
with compassion. They looked like sheep without a shepherd. And he wept for Jerusalem to see the state of things as Pharisaical legalism had just ruined the culture and the day and corrupted the worship of the people of God in the Old Testament. And so here he comes, not to argue or shout, no one would hear his voice in the streets, verse 19. All right, that's one aspect of his ministry. He spoke in front of large crowds. He would speak, for example, from the Mount of Olives. He would speak publicly, you know, at the Sermon on the Mount. But he was not one to go out and try to pick fights and start debates. The time for his second coming, that's when he brings, that's when he brings justice. That's when he brings justice to victory. See that in verse 20? He will not break a bruised reed. He will not put out a smoldering wick until he has led justice to victory. So in the first coming of Christ, he rides into Jerusalem to be slain on a donkey. In his second coming, he comes in on a white horse to slay evil forevermore. It's beautiful. He was meek. He is humble in heart, just as he said. In the midst of all these all, uh, all these arguments about, about the Sabbath, we hear echoes of Jesus' text in his sermon in, in Matthew chapter 11, his teaching in Matthew chapter 11. Right after Matthew's gospel recounts the words of Jesus, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The very next passage shows the Pharisees being combative about the disciples picking heads of grain on the Sabbath. And then right after that, we see this teaching about Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath. They set a trap for, the, for him, and he steps right in it and looks right at him and heals him, and then proclaims the fact that it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. These legalisms had completely led the, 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 the leadership astray. You had some exceptions. You have Nicodemus, you have Joseph of Arimathea, Later on, you're going to have Saul of Tarsus. But wow, their hearts were completely in the wrong place. They were breaking the bruised reeds and putting out the smoldering wicks. These two images, they denote, you know, the stalk of a plant, a reed that is bruised. All right, this is somebody who is broken over sin, someone who is over, overly laden with the legalisms of the Pharisaical teaching, somebody who is really struggling. He's not going to come around and then break you off while you struggle. If your fire has just gone out and the wick of the candle has only a string of smoke coming up thinly out of it, he's not going to snuff you out. He's going to bring you back to light. He's going to restore you. This is his character. This is his nature. This was prophesied in Isaiah 42, describing centuries before the birth of Christ, the ministry of Christ in his first coming. Today, we may not have the physical presence of Christ to walk around healing people with shriveled hands, but we do have the Holy Spirit of God, and he is called the Counselor. Today, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the presence of God, not physically, but spiritually, living right here within each of us. Jesus' ministry was not one of accosting the Pharisees publicly. In fact, when he would controvert their teachings, he would tell people to be quiet about it. He waited until the crucifixion came to do that. He would be more direct and overt with them. As you get later on to the Gospel of Matthew, he lets it be known to them that they were the bad guys in his parable all along. But at this point in his ministry, he's still shushing people. He's still silencing them, telling them not to make it known. See verse 16, he warned them not to make him known, so that what was spoken to the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Jesus knew his time had not yet come. So for example, when the crowd tries to shove him off a cliff at Capernaum, he just walks right through the crowd. He would heal the blind man like we saw earlier in Matthew and then tell him not to tell anybody. And the guy immediately goes and tells everybody. This was not only because it was not yet time for the crucifixion, this was also prophesied that Jesus would do this was foretold seven centuries before his birth. And so as he heals crowds of people and then tells them not to make a big deal out of it, we see even in that, in his meekness about his miracles, prophecy fulfilled. The Gospel of Matthew is incredible, especially when we see it in view of Isaiah and other Old Testament prophets. It's amazing 
These books were written by different authors in different places, centuries apart from each other, but they correspond harmoniously with divine perfection. Even the meekness of Jesus' miracles was foretold centuries before his birth. You can trust the Word of God.